Good morning. Welcome to this, another Word from the Word, brought to you by your friends here at the Madaryville Assembly of God. Uh, once again, we're so thankful for those of you who listen week after week. Today I want to ask you a question. Are we living in the last days? I've been asked that question lately by a number of people. I think there are those, even among the unsaved, that sense that something is about to happen. But what is it? Well, I believe that the Bible gives us an answer, perhaps not the answer that you would expect. I believe that the answer is yes, we are living in the last days, but probably not for the reasons that you think. But we're going to be reading from Acts chapter 2, uh, beginning at verse 16, and I encourage you to read and follow along in your Bibles. I want you to check out everything that I say by the Word of God today. Well, let's read. Acts 2.16, and this is right after the events of Pentecost. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my Spirit upon all flesh. I believe that that phrase, all flesh, is important in understanding the book of Acts. I believe that's kind of a key phrase in understanding Acts, all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. That's part of the all flesh, sons and daughters. And your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Once again, all flesh, young and old. And on my servants and on my handmaidens will I pour out in those days of my spirit, once again, all flesh, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke, the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Beautiful scripture. Well, back to our question, are we living in the last days? Well, some of it depends on just how you define that phrase. If you define the last days as that time right before the coming of Jesus, right before the rapture, you know, we're just hours, days away from his return, then it's still iffy. For one thing, the Lord makes it quite clear that no one knows the day nor the hour of his coming. That's why throughout the New Testament we're told not so much to get ready, but to be ready for his return. What did Jesus say? Be ye also ready, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. What are we told in 1 Thessalonians 5, 2, that the Lord will return like a thief in the night? Do you remember that? He says, yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. A thief in the night, that means he comes upon those who are unprepared. What did Jesus himself say about that in Luke chapter 12, verses 39 and 40? And this know that if the good man of the house had known in what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not have suffered or allowed his house to be broken through. Be ye therefore, that means in light of this, ready also for the Son of Man cometh at an hour when you think not. Now in light of that coming as a thief in the night, the Bible also says that those of us who are prepared should not look at his coming that way. He's not coming for us as a thief. 1 Thessalonians 5, 4, But you, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. The whole idea is, even though we don't know the day or the hour, that we're prepared. Now something else we must note here. The Apostle Paul, I believe, and all of the other apostles believed, and I believe they taught, the imminent return of the Lord Jesus Christ. That means that he could come at any time. Uh, I think one place we can see this really clearly is 1 Thessalonians 4.15. He's speaking to the Thessalonians who had some misunderstandings about the coming of the Lord. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord that we, notice the word we, we which are alive and remain under the coming of the Lord shall not prevent. That means we won't go before those which are asleep, those who have died in Christ. He says, we who are alive and remain. He really believed 
that he would be in that number that went in the rapture, that number that did not see physical death as we know it, that number that would see the coming of the Lord in his lifetime. And so many since then have believed the same thing, and even today, I believe that Jesus could come in my lifetime, that I might be in that number, just as Paul believed he might be in that number. Now we have a question, though, based on that imminent return of Jesus. If His coming is imminent, if His coming could be at any time, what do we do about all of these so-called signs of the times? Those signs that we often look at as, as reminders that Jesus is coming soon. Matthew 24 is the place where we see many of those so-called signs of the times. Matthew 24, 3, and it says, As he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. False Christs, false prophets, it should not surprise us to see them in the day and time in which we're living. And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. So uh, don't get all up in the air about it. Know that these are things that will be occurring all through the last days. For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. Just know to expect these things all through the age in which we're living. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Verse 8 is a very important verse. Make a mental note of verse 8. We'll come back to it. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. We don't see very much, if any, real persecution here in the United States yet, but we have brothers and sisters all over the world that have been experiencing persecution all through this church age in which we're living. And then many shall be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many, and the word literally there is most, the love of most shall wax or grow cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. Well, as I told you, verse 8 is very important in our understanding of these signs. Jesus speaks of this being the beginning of sorrows. Literally, the beginning of sorrows is the Greek word which has to do with the birth pangs, the pains of travail, a woman that is about to have a child. As a woman is in pregnancy, there may be times when she has those, uh, those contractions that come before, those Braxton Hicks contractions. They're sort of the prelude of things to come, but as it gets closer to the coming of the baby, those contractions are going to become more urgent, they're going to become stronger, they're going to come closer together. And when it comes time for the delivery of the baby, they're going to be very close together. So I believe that Jesus is telling us that we can expect these signs perhaps all the way through the age in which we're living until He comes, but there may be a time when they grow in intensity, they grow in frequency as we get nearer the coming of the Lord. All that being said, there is no real way to predict exactly when the Lord will come based on the signs of the times. It's futile. We, we don't know the day or the hour. But they simply remind us to be ready always. Anyone who claims to have some special formula, some special method, for predicting His coming is one of two things. They're either deceived, or worse yet, they're a deceiver. So if you believe that the term last day speaks of the time immediately before the return of Christ, then it remains to be seen whether or not we're in that time, because none of us know when Jesus is coming. We can't know for sure based on the imminent return of our Lord. 
So I ask the question again, are we in the last days? Well, I believe, as I said, the answer is yes, but for a different reason than the signs of the times, as important as those signs are, to help us to be ready always. It's not about the signs of the times as much as about something else. Just a few moments ago, I read a part of Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost. The day the church was born, the, the sermon that he preached that day after 120 were baptized in the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Speaking in tongues as the Spirit of God gave them utterance and walking in that newfound power and anointing that God had given them. There were those that saw that that day. There was a great crowd that began to gather and, and they asked, seeing what they were seeing and hearing what they were hearing, what does this mean? What meaneth this? The King James Version says. And in answer to their question, Peter took them directly to the Word of God. And I tell you what, that is something I come back to again and again. When you have questions, go to the Word of God. If you ask me a question, I hope to take you to the Word of God. He says, I want to tell you that what you are seeing and what you are hearing today is scriptural. It's according to the word of God. This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. That's what you're seeing. That's what you're hearing today. So those spirit inspired words of the prophet Joel spoken on that day and quoted by Peter. Make it very clear as you read them that the last days began that very moment with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Now, if you can think of something with me as the last days spoken of here by Joel and quoted by Peter, as being marked by a very prominent beginning and an ending, perhaps you might look at it, as I often have, as two bookends. The first bookend, the first prominent event, being the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, the beginning of the last days. The end of the last days is also spoken of there in that same prophecy. That's the, the events that we see that are more like tribulation type events. The sun darkened, the moon turned to blood, all of those things. So the answer is yes, we are in the last days, but it's a time of undetermined length, beginning on the day of Pentecost and ending when Christ comes in power and glory. So I have to tell you, yes, we are living in the last days, but like I said, not for the reason perhaps that you thought. So the last days begin at Pentecost. They'll continue until Jesus comes. That being the case, what should we expect in this day and time in which we're living these last days? Well, let's look at a few things. We're going to look at several things that might be considered negatives and then one glorious positive. Well, the first negative, in the last days we can expect to see scoffers mocking the, the doctrine of his return. Some unwise Christians have been the cause of some of this mocking. There have been those throughout the history of the church who have come up with plans and schemes to try to determine the time of his coming. And when those dates and times have failed to come to pass, it has caused those who heard that teaching to perhaps become a little more calloused to the truth of his return. Those failed dates have caused them to become a little more uh, immune to being moved by talk of his coming. And you know, it's happened all through the church age. There have been those who have wrongly predicted a time for his coming. Even now, the Bible tells us, and Peter writes about it in 2 Peter 3 and 3, that there'll be scoffers that because of that will mock, they'll scoff at the idea that Jesus is coming or that he's coming anytime soon. 2 Peter 3, 3, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days. That's the time we're living in right now. Scoffers, those who mock. Scoffers walking after their own lusts, doing whatever their fleshly desires would dictate to them. And saying, where is the promise of his coming? We have heard it all along. Where is this promised return that you've been telling us about? For since the fathers fell asleep, they said, we've heard about it since our grandparents' day. Since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. And of course, 
All things aren't as they were from the beginning of the creation. They, they failed to take into consideration that early on, God did destroy the world that was by a great flood. Things aren't like they were from the beginning of creation. And there's going to be another big change one day. So there were already scoffers by the time the Apostle Peter, I wrote this just in that next generation after the Lord went back to heaven. And now here we are, nearly 2,000 years later, and there are even more scoffers out there than even before, and I believe we're seeing a growing number of people today, even some that I would consider quote-unquote big-name preachers and teachers, that are denying that Jesus is going to return, at least the way we have always believed, that He's going to return imminently, that it could happen at any time. I believe things like that are a part of what we're seeing People living like Jesus is not going to return at all. Jesus made it clear that the time before His coming would be like it was before the great flood in Noah's day. Noah may have preached and taught, you know the Bible says he was a preacher of righteousness. He may have preached and taught that the flood was coming, but there were those who undoubtedly scoffed, just as there are those who scoff today when you try to tell them that Jesus could come at any time. So Jesus tells us in Matthew 24 and 37, But as the days of Noah were, so also shall the coming of the Son of Man be. That's His return. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. All of those are good things in the right context. Until the day that Noah entered the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. What do we make of the marrying, giving in marriage, eating and drinking? Well, they were going about their business as usual without a thought that they were really on borrowed time, that judgment was coming, just as it's going to come one day upon this world. We also know that the days of Noah were days that were demonic, days that were violent, and days that were perverted, and so it should not surprise us to see violence, perversion, and the demonic element very much at work in our world today. We know that Jesus is coming, but we know that He's coming for those who are looking for Him. Uh, Hebrews 9, 28 says He'll appear the second time to those that look for Him. Uh, not for the complacent, not for the scoffers, not for the deniers, but those who look for Him. I pray that you're looking for Him. So one of the things we can expect, one of the negative things in these last days, is for there to be scoffers. It shouldn't take us aback. We shouldn't be surprised. Uh, we should realize that this is just something that our Lord reminded us of. And uh, just another reminder that He speaks the truth and whatever He says will be what is. So the second kind of negative thing, in the last days we can expect a rejection of the clear, simple teaching and preaching of the Word of God. This, the simple teaching of the Word of God, something that is not going to be wanted or desired in the last day. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, I believe makes it clear. It does not use the phrase last days, but I believe the context makes it clear that this is at least a part of it. What does it say? 2 Timothy 4, 2. Preach the Word. Be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, Exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. I believe we're already there in this day in which we're living. But after their own lusts, and there's that phrase again, just doing whatever they want to do, fulfilling every lust of their flesh. They shall heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears, and they shall turn their ears away from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. They will not endure sound teaching, healthy doctrine. They, they won't want to hear the simple teaching and preaching of the Word of God. They'll want to hear only that which allows them to follow their own lustful way of life. They only want to hear what they want to hear, not what they need to hear. So the simple preaching and teaching of the Word of God may not be all that popular in the last days. It may not be what draws the big crowds or the big offerings, but it should not surprise us in the least to see a rejection of the teaching of the true, unadulterated Word of God 
in these last days. And then the third, what we might call a negative, we can expect the last days to be demonically fierce. Demonically fierce. I know that's a strong statement, but I believe it's very true. 2 Timothy 3.1, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. It's from that word perilous that I get that phrase demonically fierce. Perilous is an English translation of a Greek word, chalepas. That's a rare word in the New Testament. In fact, it only appears two times, once here in 2 Timothy 3, and then the second time in Matthew 8, where it speaks of two demoniacs, very dangerous, violent demoniacs. Matthew 8, 28, And when he was come to the other side into the country of the Gergesenes, there met him two possessed with devils, coming out of the tombs exceeding fierce. Chalepas is the word. So that no man might pass by that way. So the ravings of these demoniacs is described using the very same word that Paul uses to describe the perilous times that we will face here in the last days. So that means we can't expect to see things getting better and better in the last days. In fact, Sad to say, we will see the opposite in many ways. 2 Timothy 3, 13 says, Evil men and seducers, spiritual seduction, shall wax or grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Now, what do perilous times look like, these demonically violent times, according to the Apostle Paul? Well, he describes some of them to a young pastor, uh, beginning in 2 Timothy 3, 2, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. Lovers of their own selves, that's a spirit of narcissism at an all-time high, self-love. Covetous, greed, and all that goes along with greed, the love of money, which the Bible describes as the root of all evil. Boasters, an elevation of self, and especially self-talk. Uh, proud, the sin of pride, is what cost Satan his exalted place around the throne of God. Blasphemers, vile, abusive language, and, and we see such an increase of just horrible language. Even, uh, you know, I've heard it once in a while that it's been spoken from pulpits in the United States. May God help us. Disobedient to parents, a spirit of rebellion. Unthankful, you know, a, a spirit of entitlement, uh, ingratitude. Unholy. Holiness of heart in these last days will be the exception rather than the rule. We read on in verses 3 and 4, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, without natural affection. Now, immediately a lot of people will hear that and they think that it's speaking of the sin of homosexuality. And you would tend to think that because that is against natural affection, natural love. But the Greek word here has to do with family love. Uh, this is the idea of there won't even be the normal love like that a parent would have for their children, for example. You know, we, we see a breakdown in families. We see parents doing horrendous things. And we wonder, how can that possibly be that's so evil? Well, it's a lack of natural affection. Truth breakers, those who do not keep their word, their promises, incontinent, those who lack self-restraint, self-control, those who are just going wild, fierce, animal-like desires, animal-like actions, despisers of those that are good. You know, we shouldn't be surprised by a growing hatred of godliness, a, a growing hatred of the true church and true Christians. The world will begin to call good evil and evil good, as we see so clearly today. Traitors, those who betray their sacred trust, heady, reckless, and headstrong in their actions, high-minded, filled with selfish pride, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, a pleasure-crazed society. And then we read verse 5, where it says we can expect crossless religion. And I would add bloodless religion. 2 Timothy 3, 5, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. Religion without the cross, religion without the blood of Christ is just that, it is just religion. 
Dead religion without any power. Because we're told in 1 Corinthians 1.18 where the power is. The power will be manifest where the cross of Christ is preached. He says the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. The power of God is the preaching of the cross. So there'll be no shortage of religion in the last days, but there will be a real shortage of those who will preach and teach the blood of Christ, the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ on the cross, the, the all-sufficiency of His sacrifice. All of these things are very demonically inspired. They're, they're a part of those perilous times, those chalepas times. So it's very clear what we mean when we say that the last days will be demonically violent. And then, just as I said, there'll be a very strong positive. Number four, expect the last days to be times of great spiritual opportunity. Praise God. Often when we hear the prophecy of Joel preached and taught, we hear it preached and taught as if the last day speaks of some future time that we're looking forward to a great end-time revival. He'll pour out His Spirit in the last days. Now don't get me wrong, there are other scriptures. We might speak of scriptures referring to the latter rain and, and those kinds of things that we might speak of a, a revival at the end of time, but I don't believe we can accurately preach that from here in Acts 2. Because as we've seen, if the last days begin at Pentecost, we have to realize that that outpouring of the Spirit began then and is going to continue until Jesus comes in power and glory. We're living in the time when God is pouring out His Spirit upon all flesh. He poured out His Spirit upon me. I trust He's poured out His Spirit upon you. We're living in the time when not every single individual will be filled with the Holy Spirit, but the great privilege is open to all. Now, according to Joel's prophecy and Peter's quoting of that prophecy, uh, we're living in a glorious time of outpouring, where he's pouring his, his Spirit out. Uh, remember, let's listen to verses 17 and 18 of Acts 2 again. I'll pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. What does that mean? Well, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams, and on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. So here is the promise of glorious spiritual opportunity in these last days. In the last days revival of which we are a part, there are no gender uh, barriers. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. In this great last day's revival in which we are a part, there are no age barriers. Both young men and old men will be moved upon by the Spirit of God. In this great last day's revival of which we are a part, there'll be no social barriers. He said even the servants and the handmaidens, the, the lowliest echelon of society in that day would be filled with the Holy Spirit. And he makes it clear later on in Acts 2, that that opportunity will continue until Jesus comes. Acts 2.39, he says, For the promise, that's the promise of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, is unto you. That's those that were there that day. And to your children, that means the next generation, and I believe every generation since. To all that are afar off, that includes those of you who are listening today. Even as many as the Lord our God shall call, that means as long as, as He is calling people to salvation during these last days, He's also giving them opportunity to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. So because we're living in the last days, you can be filled with the Holy Spirit today. The promise is for you. The promise is for your children. The promise is for them that are afar off. The promise is to as many as the Lord our God shall call. Praise God. But there's even a more wonderful promise in these last days. It's verse 20. 1 of Acts 2, and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That will be true from the day of Pentecost till the day that Jesus returns. So because we're living in this last day, these last days before the return of Christ, if you will call on the name of the Lord today, you can be saved. 
You can call on him right now. You can fall on your knees right where you are and say, Lord, save my soul. I believe that Jesus died for me. You can turn from your sin and turn to Jesus in faith and be saved right there where you are. And he'll write your name down in the book of life. He'll reserve a place for you in heaven. Nothing could be more wonderful than that, friend. So, yes, there are many negative things about the last days, the times in which we're living, and we often get caught up in the negative talk, and we do see the signs of the times, and, and we see a world that isn't getting any better. And we could talk about how the love of many will grow cold, and we could even talk about what is spoken of in the Bible, a, a great apostasy, a, a falling away. But I'd rather look today at the great opportunity this is the day that we can be saved, we can be filled with the Holy Spirit. This makes this, that makes this the greatest era of opportunity that the world has ever known. That makes this the greatest period of possible evangelism and, and missions that this world has ever known. That makes this the greatest time that you and I could have possibly been born in these last days when God is doing these great things by His Spirit. It's the greatest hour that we could ever live, hands down. So in light of that, if someone asks you, are we living in the last days? You can tell them with a smile on your face. You can tell them with a shout, yes, my friend, we are living in the last days. And that means that if you'll call on the Lord right now, you can be saved. That means that if you're powerless and living for God, that he'll empower you with the Holy Spirit. If you'll just ask him. So can you say, praise the Lord? Yes, we are living in the last days. Praise God. Well, let's take a moment and pray and thank Him for that. Father, I thank You that we are living in the last days. And Lord, that is a wonderful time of opportunity. I thank You, Lord, that You have called us into the kingdom for such a time as this. Thank You, Lord God, that if there are any that are listening today that are lost, they can call upon the Lord in faith today and He'll redeem them. If there are those, Lord God, that need to be empowered by the Holy Spirit, that you would remind them that your word says that you will give the Holy Spirit to those who ask. And we thank you for these things, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Praise his holy name forever. Praise God for living in this day and time. I pray until we meet again that he will hold you in the hollow of his hand. We hope to see you soon either here, there, or in the air, if Jesus comes, because Jesus is coming again. Maranatha.